Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for the gang that's signed in here. It's so, so lovely to see your faces. I love it. And uh, to see your name, if you're keeping your camera off, that's totally okay too. I know that you, it's a personal boundary, yay. <laughs> Which is what we're talking about tonight. <clears throat> Boundaries. Uh, Tis the season is always the season. Um, yeah, so this arose because of another group I was in this week and uh, we were, the discussion <clears throat> came around to this time of year. This is uh, mid-December and many folks have different larger gatherings happening with folks they might not be seeing regularly or it might not be chosen company always of family or friends or work gatherings or whatever all the permutations of holiday gatherings that might be happening <clears throat> and uh in that <laughs> group <clears throat> Um, I'll just apologize for this occasional cough that it's a residue of one of the viruses going around. In that uh, group earlier this week, there were we were um, sharing reflections and talking about the Dharma of how to be skillful in these gatherings where there may be people, uh, this was in particular a white identified anti-racism group and so we were talking about uh you know if someone in family or friend uh is saying or being racist and and how to deal with that when there's personal history and identities and roles and all of the complicated triggers and we were talking about boundaries and how to establish healthy boundaries and uh, to get navigate these challenging situations, to say the least. <clears throat> and uh, the the a lot of what I'm sharing tonight is inspired by an uh, article written by Philip Moffat. Philip Moffat is a Dharma teacher. He was one of he and Sally Armstrong, I believe, were. <clears throat> to, two of the first co-guiding uh, teachers at Spirit Rock, and his teachers were Jack Cornfield and Joseph Goldstein and Sharon Salzberg, and uh, and then many other um, Dharma teachers. Um, So down below, I'll share a link to his site, and you can read more about his extensive history of um, dharma and teaching <clears throat> and study and practice. And uh, so he wrote this article called Setting Personal Boundaries, which I will link down below. And um, it's great. It's really good. Um, and he starts this article, and I'll just share this quote because it's such a good question from a student. Um, this was after in a weekly meditation class, similar to how this is, and somebody, uh, one of the participants, what was saying, talking about how she felt repeatedly taken advantage of, and he listened to her describe another painful experience with a friend that had been inappropriate and he told her you need to work on improving your emotional boundaries and she was surprised by this comment and responded in this way but the teachings of the buddha say we aren't separate that and so why would i need boundaries what am i protecting isn't the whole idea to not be attached to the needs of my ego. So well said. <laughs> and, and really points to a, a really important and confusing part of what we may have gleaned from the Dharma. 
you know, the, the, the teachings say that we're, we're not separate, we're not separate individual isolated beings we are interconnected and um conditioned beings and uh and you know a lot of the teachings point to uh, understanding how we can get really lost in a delusion of a separate self a separate continu continuous um isolated self and so this can really and and the teachings also talk about not clinging to self and the delusion of um not seeing clearly the nature of self and you know constantly trying to please the self and get what we want and get rid of what we don't want and how this is related to suffering. And so, you know, this this uh, student sharing this question with Philip Moffat um, is, what you know, pointing this confusion out, like boundaries. I thought I'm supposed to be just like infinite and boundless and, uh, you know, not reinforcing the self. And um, it's so perfectly said by another teacher and psychologist named Jack Engler, E-N-G-L-E-R, who says, um, you have to have a healthy self in order to let go of a self. That's, that just says it so clearly. We have to first have developmentally a healthy sense of self in order to, well, partially in order to really develop a meditation practice and in order to, I mean, these ha can happen simultaneously. <clears throat> we need to have a sense of self in order to practice with the skillfulness to be able to see the clinging to self and to see through the the illusion of what we take a self to be. So developmentally, we need to first have a healthy sense of self. And uh, there's a, a wonderful quote here. <clears throat> Oh, this, this is this is also so excellent. Philip Moffat says here, I often urge students to think less about killing their ego and more about not identifying with what it wants. It's not your ego that causes your suffering. It's believing that life is all about meeting its endless wants. That's so good <laughs> it's not about you know shattering destroying it's about seeing clearly what is the self what is the nature of the self and we did a whole series here on the five aggregates and it's that's another whole topic uh that you can you can look up on this youtube channel um yeah so it's it's not uh, about eradicating the self anatta not self doesn't mean that there is no self it's not no self it's not self it's seeing what self is and not um being deluded by that and not constantly con trying trying to control the world, control our environment in order to reinforce, um, constantly trying to meet these needs. So, <clears throat> so the importance of boundaries. Um, and there's physical boundaries and emotional boundaries. I would also say energetic boundaries, but, um, and these are interrelated. 
<clears throat> it's uh, so physical boundaries. I, I love that we've developed many of us. It just took. It, I I still have to pretty really be conscious and intentional about asking people if they would like a hug before I I'm all up in it. You know, but that's part of developing personal boundaries is is saying, how do you feel about hugs or are you okay with a hug or and I just love it when people say not so much or well, not right now, or you know, just it that's so hard to say. And it's so great. I appreciate it so much when people do. It's great that we're starting to develop even the the practice of asking rather than just you know some of us um myself included naturally tend towards that and others are definitely quite clear on mm, no i'm good thanks <laughs> or you know or kind of doing a side hug or a fist bump or you know all the different ways um i mean that's a minor version of physical boundaries we we certainly know about um unwanted physical touch in the workplace in the in your home in uh, social settings and so that kind of physical boundary and but also energetic or emotional boundaries and of course, most of what we've learned about boundaries comes from our childhood experiences or um, or the violation of boundaries from those places. <clears throat> and uh, it really takes <clears throat> a lot of exploration and a lot of practice and a lot of intention to uh, really develop these and recreate them. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how to do that. Uh, it's very helpful. I find it very helpful to not think of boundaries like a wall. <laughs> the, you know, like a brick wall or something. It's like, that's my boundary. It's like super solid and permanent and immovable. Um, for me, I think of it more like a field, an energetic or a, um, oh, for me, it's like a bubble that I can expand or contract. Um, it can get kind of more solid or more permeable, um, or it could just kind of be like a sense of a field of energy, uh, a really <laughs> helpful image uh, is of a, fen a, a fence with a gate instead of a wall. So thinking of your boundary as a gate, a fence that has a gate, and you decide when you want to open that gate or close that gate. So it's not a, a solid fix, even with one particular situation or individual it may depend on the day it may depend on infinite variables uh um you know how far open do you want that gate to be or not not today um <clears throat> uh philip moffat also describes boundaries as i love this term stewardship which is I was like, wow, that's so great. So stewardship is is like when we supervise or take care of something like stewardship of the land or stewardship. So that kind of caretaking. And I love that phrase in reference to boundaries. So this sense of responsibility of taking care of this body, these emotions, this these mind states is uh, again, a healthy, very healthy and important part of development. Not to be clung to, but to be developed. 
So I, I love that phrase. So boundaries as a field or as a, a fence with a gate or as stewardship. Oh, that's so caring. That's so self-compassionate. I really love it. Hmm. So <clears throat> developing boundaries. Therapy is great. <laughs> Meditation is not the be-all and end-all of all the ways we can develop a, a healthy self. I'm all for counseling and therapy and lots of different ways of learning. It's very important. Um, so it, I, I, I think it's developed primarily through intention. We have to, first of all, have the intention Um of non-harm, the intention of um, wanting to practice this stewardship and this self-care. It's also taking care of others. When we have healthy boundaries, we're not going to be violating other people's boundaries. <clears throat> so there's intention, which then fuels the practice. We need to practice boundaries. We need to, you know, start with small steps and practice with people that are, it's safe to, to practice saying no, to practice saying not right now, um, et cetera. <clears throat> I feel like curiosity is another quality, <clears throat> which is, these are, these earrings that were made by uh, uh, artists that say Dhamma Vachaya which is um, curiosity, investigation of the Dhamma. And um, so curiosity, which is this, um, <clears throat> not so much a mental factor, but it's uh, seeing with the eyes of the Dhamma, like, what is this? And mm, what's really happening? And uh, what is a skillful way? So that kind of curiosity. And very much the factor of self-compassion, compassion for others, karuna, but uh, uh, self-compassion in this case, we're talking about personal boundaries <coughs> and that sense of stewardship of care for this being uh, and is, I feel, a really important part of this. Um, so some of the, the ways we're going to talk about a particular uh, practice that Philip is offering here, but it, in, yeah, I've been really paying attention to this boundaries this week, just as I've been mulling over this topic and, um, feeling really inspired by friends and acknowledging their practice of the ways they've said no I was just talking with a friend today who was um talking about you know somebody that's really really pushing and has a history of pushing a boundary and and the clarity of this friend that was saying you know we're not going there let's not do this let's not have this conversation again and the person kept pushing and pushing and they just kept saying, let's not do this. I don't want to do this. We're not going to do this. And just had to keep saying it in different ways until, it, you know, it finally landed. But they didn't escalate and they didn't react. They just stayed steady, really clear, beautiful example. Um, another friend this week was talking about uh, a sibling relationship. and. Uh, <clears throat> they were kind of saying <coughs> sorry that um they felt they weren't that good at boundaries or they they really need to work on that and I was like what you're so good at boundaries because they've been really working on it for years and and saying what they needed saying no saying I need to go now like lots and lots of ways of setting boundaries um but they felt like you know, it wasn't all tied up with a bow. Like I haven't nailed it yet. I haven't got there. And you're, I'm like, you're not going to. 
you got you got to keep working it. It's got it. It keeps changing. You got to keep you know developing it, refining it, getting clearer. It's not like something we we, we like get and then check it off the list. It's a continual process and development and deepening and clarifying and uh, as relationships keep changing. Yeah, so it can show up by, uh, we were talking, the start of this was about like getting together with extended family around holiday times. And I often, and I love doing it, I walk away. <laughs> I'll just like slip away. It, I don't need to make an announcement. It's just like going to the washroom except for I go to a room and I'm just like, just some quiet, just chill, slow down, stop the input, stop the output most especially. Yeah, just walking away. Most excellent thing to do. Um, another thing is saying no. I remember Maya Angelou, I heard this years ago, and I could find it again. I should have found it before this call. Maybe I'll put it in the link below. It's hard to find. But I remember her, maybe it was Oprah sharing that Maya had taught her this thing of just saying no. Like not, not a big story of no, but just no. Or no, she would say stop. I've tried this a few times and it works <laughs> so far <laughs> where somebody's, you know, <laughs> saying something harmful, <laughs> uh, you know, or often or gossip or something and just stop. And they're usually so shocked that somebody says stop that they actually stop. That's from Maya Angelou. Uh, changing the subject, you know, we might need to divert, or if you're able to address it directly, but not reactively, there's the key. So sometimes that means come back to it later, address it at a later time. It doesn't have to be right then. You can revisit things, you can return to it when you're not going to be reactive, and you can <clears throat> address it <clears throat> responsibly responding okay there's so much about this that I'd love to just <laughs> have a chat with you all about <laughs> one sec hmm. so Philip Moffat shares these four steps to of what he's calling here boundary lessons <clears throat> around learning how and where to draw the line. Four step boundary practice. I love it when people get all pithy like this da, 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 with these uh, acronyms and things. It's really helpful. So he starts with <laughs> the first one <clears throat> is <laughs> recognize. I like these words recognize because I was thinking of it as recognize, put a little hyphen in there, recognize, recognize, cognizing, meaning to perceive or become aware of. So re, you know, reconnect with perceiving, seeing clearly, becoming aware. So recognize, he talks about this as practice being mindful of your emotional body. This is how we learn to recognize, like it's our alert system, that something's wrong. It's our internal alarm that's like, meh. So learn to really name it and recognize when that's happening. It can show up in a variety of ways, depending on the violations we've experienced to our boundaries, or to the intensity of the, the um, imposition that's happening. So it can be a feeling of shock, of numbness, disconnect, confusion, powerlessness, or when we get into a loop of, oh, it's my fault, I'm this, I'm that, you know, that, that beautiful loop. Um, 
So what are, how does it show up in your system? Or, you know, when your adrenal system is kicking in to fight or flight or freeze, fawn. Um, so this is recognized. This first starting to really recognize ha what happens in your system so that you can identify it when it's happening. The second the, um, piece that Philip is offering here is called recollect. Again, we could put a hyphen in there, recollect. And this is like recollecting, recollecting mindfulness of the physical body. So the first piece is the emotional body, and this is this physical body. <clears throat> so this is, as we know <clears throat> from our practice, the first foundation of mindfulness, mindfulness of body, which always is in the present moment. And so it's very, very simple. Like, what's your touch point? What can you feel your hands, your feet, your seat, your breath? Any sensations of the body that, um, awaken us to present moment because if you know that first part of recognizing when we're in a triggered state we're often you know those other things i listed of disconnection dissociation shock confusion powerlessness uh swirling story loops um these are often not <clears throat> embodied in the present moment so first we recognize what's happening and then recollect recollect awareness into the body present moment and then once we're in the body we can feel the physical sensations that are connected with that emotional state so what what sensations are happening so we're dropping out of the storyline what sensations are happening? Are we holding our breath? Is the heart pounding? Is the gut in knots? Are the fists clenched? Um, yeah, I was watching somebody talking about this uh, family situation that was coming up. And um, they, as they were describing it, their hands were in fists. <laughs> like they're like, yeah, they just, and I was like, wow, body language happening there. Um, so to feel the physical sensations that are happening at the same time as the emotional states. And that helps you then connect in a different way to the emotional state. The third step that Philip Moffat is offering here is discern. Um, so... <clears throat> This is where we're consciously <clears throat> acknowledging that a boundary is feeling breached. And it's so, so we so often blame ourselves about that, like that we're doing something wrong. And it's like, it's so important to pay attention to. And so he says, at this point, you know that something feels wrong emotionally because we've recognized that. And you're present in the body. We've recollected, recollect. Um, and you confirm that you don't have to feel this way. So here now we have some choice coming in. So sometimes you might be able to name the violation. Other times you won't. You just know that something's not right. So it's really connecting like, oh, recognizing what's going on, feeling the ground, feeling the body, present moment, and discerning, hey, this is a boundary issue. Um, and then the last step, of course, is to act, <laughs> which um, as skillfully as possible. So this is maybe when it, Walking away is helpful, or just saying stop and then walk away, um, or 
deciding to address it at another time when you're not in a triggered state. Um, yeah, and he, he also mentions therapy here, you know, um, of course, our practice, mindfulness, meditation, developing uh, these abilities to recognize what's happening and to be skillful, hopefully. <clears throat> so recognize, recollect, discern, and act. Um, yeah, so <laughs> do check out the article um, that Philip goes into much more fulsome uh, exploration of this topic. And I've probably said enough at this point. So I'd like to um, do practice tonight. And as we've done sometimes with topics like this, we'll, we'll um, use some recall to maybe imagine uh, something, a situation you think may be coming up, you know, even though, you know, we're not going to attach to that or create a big story of future imaginings because we know that's not skillful uh, but there that may already be present for you of like some concern oh this is going up how am I going to be with this or something that has happened in the past that you want to reflect on and we'll use these tools to um to explore what might be possible there <clears throat> um yeah, that's it. Okay, so let's get ready for a practice. Adjust your posture, get any other supports that you need. <clears throat> and dim your lights or turn away from the computer. Okay, so when you're when you've brought in the supports that your body needs, see if the you know this topic may be kind of activating. So see if you need any movements or touch or turning your head, looking around your space. <clears throat> self-touch or some stretching, See, just uh, beginning with kindness and gentleness to yourself. And if or when you feel ready for stillness, inviting that sense of collecting and settling, gathering, Let all these words just flutter down like snowflakes, dissolving or settling, letting go of all of that swirling. Finding a posture for the eyes that is conducive to settling and wakefulness. So some folks like to practice with the eyes slightly open. Others practice with eyes closed. Or if you're feeling activated by this topic, you might like to have the eyes resting on something peaceful or beautiful in your environment. And then feeling into any tensions in the area of the face. Mm -hmm. 
and seeing if some release or softening is possible there. And then feeling into any habit tensions or activation in the neck or shoulders. And letting that soften. Shoulder bones sliding downward. As the crown of the head reaches upwards, not with tension, but with ease. The weight of the shoulders sliding down through elbows into relaxed hands. And then feeling into the area of the torso, noticing any tensions in the back. Heart center, belly center. Is there some degree of letting go or softening that can happen here? And as we begin to soften and settle into the self in the present moment, feeling a sense of weightedness and connection through the hips and legs and feet. Or if you're laying down with the back body. <coughs> <coughs> And so choosing here what's safe and appropriate for you tonight, you might choose to just continue with this part of recollecting, of bringing mindfulness to the physical body, the moment, choosing an anchor like hands or feet or breath. And really just supporting the development of that awareness, which is absolutely fundamental. First foundation of our practice. So you could just continue with that, choosing an anchor. Or if you choose, you could very gently, not bringing in a traumatic violation of boundaries, but <clears throat> some recollection of an interaction or a situation or an anticipated situation. Again, not choosing something that's really going to be triggering, but just slightly activating so that we can explore this practice. First of all, to recognize, become aware of what happens in your system. Is there some confusion, powerlessness? Um, is there a habit towards 
blaming yourself. Is there numbness? Is there a lot of doubt or abandoning ourselves? And not to judge any of this, but really listen to it. This is your internal alarm that letting you know If you're feeling triggered or overwhelmed by this, you can open your eyes, move, let go of the practice. And now we'll all move to this second part of the practice to recollect or recollect where we bring mindfulness to the physical body. Again, if you need to, you can open eyes or move. Or just connect again with the sensation of your feet. Your hands or your breath. And let's all just rest there, reconnecting with the physical sensation in the present moment for a period of time here. If you notice the mind is getting hooked back into a story, <clears throat> recollect, recollect awareness, present moment physical sensations. And see, so perhaps you can identify what physical sensations are happening in relationship with these emotional states. Is there tension, numbness, contraction? And as you feel the physical sensations of the anchor you've chosen, feet or hands or breath, perhaps imagine, reflect on 
connecting with that anchor in a triggered situation. Your inner alarm goes off. You recognize that. And then recollect, ground. The third aspect of this practice is discerning that a boundary is being breached and you have a right to protect yourself. You might not be able to name what's happening, but you just know something is not right. And you have a, a right to this self-compassion, to this stewardship of a healthy sense of self. And the last part of this four-step boundary practice is acting. So you might like to reflect on the times where you were able to divert or address or <clears throat> take care of yourself, take care of others. Or you might gently imagine a situation that we're projecting maybe coming up and, and kind of role playing in your mind how you might take care, how you might act as skillfully as possible. And then let's all recollect, reconnect with the body, present moment, sensations of feet, hands, or breath. Let all this imagining or reflection float away. If you're feeling overwhelmed or activated, you could Open your eyes or move or place a hand at your heart. Notice any areas of tension that have crept into your habit places. For these last few minutes of silence together, let's stay with this development of connection with physical body in the present moment.
was just remembering as the practice was ending, I was kind of using some metta phrases uh, with myself. And when I use the phrase, may I be safe, metta is one of our companion practices to insight meditation of uh, to cultivating loving kindness and friendliness with ourselves and each other and all beings. <clears throat> and uh, one of the phrases, uh, the intentions that we cultivate is um, may I, may you, may all beings be safe, may we be well, may we be happy, etc. And um, yeah, for me, every time I practice metta, may I be safe, is about boundaries. So it's also may I be safe from physical harm, like we all want to be safe. Um, but it's also, I, I, for me, it's largely a boundary. May I be safe? Yeah. So I was just uh, noticing that coming up at the end of this uh, meditation. <clears throat> uh, so uh, if you've joined us on this uh, YouTube recording, please check the links below um, to Philip Moffat's article and his website and um, his other teachings. <coughs> and uh, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us here. Uh, and next week will be uh, probably a solstice theme. Next Wednesday is winter solstice. So, <clears throat> yay, return of the light. Um, Okay, thanks for joining us on this recording. <clears throat>